This video covers an introduction to getting going in Fulcro, and it's meant for beginning users who typically don't have a whole lot of exposure to uh, Fulcro or Clojure or ClojureScript, um, but hopefully you'll find tidbits in here even if you're an experienced user. So the first thing we want to do is just set up the bare minimum project. Now I recommend using Shadow CLJS uh, as the compiler. Uh, it avoids the CLJSJS uh, ecosystem uh, it's a really nice compiler to use, um, and it uses the NPM ecosystem directly. It makes it a lot easier to use quite a few of the, the uh, React resources that are available to you when working with um, front end. So you're going to start off with just a package.json file, just like you would in any other NPM-based JavaScript project. Um, and the only things we need here are React, React DOM, and Shadow CLJS. Uh, the version of React, Fulcro 3 should work with everything from React 15 forward. Um, as you see here, I'm using 16.9 for this demo. Once you've got NPM set up, of course, you're going to do an NPM install and get those, uh, those things into your node modules directory. Uh, you're also going to want to set up uh, closure dependencies. The Shadow CLGS compiler is actually a closure program. Uh, that runs in the Java virtual machine, so of course you're going to have to have Java installed. A JDK 1.8 or 1.11. Um, 10 doesn't work particularly well, but uh, either either 8 or 11. Um, I think I'm currently um, I'm using 11 here in the demo. Uh, and the way I like to configure closure projects these days is using Depseden. And uh, if you're using Homebrew, you can do a brew install. Uh, closure to get the CLI tools uh, for dealing with depths. And the uh, the items that you need here, the only hard dependency you need is Fulcro. Uh, at the time of this recording, I'm, I'm on beta 13 uh, in the 3.0 release. And then the alias section lets you add just a, some additional um, aliases where you can add additional things to your class path, additional source directories, etc. Um, and because ClojureScript compiles to JavaScript, well, then at runtime, I don't actually need the Closure Script language, the Shadow CLGS compiler, or the development tools that uh, these are development tools for Chrome that uh, let you do source level debugging. Oh, no, I'm sorry. They let you see Closure data structures and such in Chrome. Uh, the source maps let you do the source level debugging. Uh, and those come out of the compilers. Uh, so I usually configure things like this, uh, just, you know, latest versions. Then, of course, you're going to need, uh, if we look at the the tree we, we started with here, you're going to need an HTML file. So the convention is to use a resources public directory. Um, and so, you know, I just made a very simple index file here. Uh, you see I've got uh, UTF-8 marker that helps with some, you know, potential encoding issues down the line. Uh, a div with an ID. Uh, I typically use app as the ID. And then you're going to call as uh, you're going to need to load the compiled JavaScript, and I'm just going to choose to name it uh, js slash main slash main.js, which is going to be relative to index, uh, which means it's going to be in this resources public directory as well once it's generated. Uh, so that's all the HTML I need for the entire project is just that that placeholder that has a div and a way to load uh, the JavaScript that will be the, the thing you compile. Now, of course, we need some code. Um, and that's pretty simple as well. Uh, and I've just made a, a very simple uh, uh, namespace here in the source app client CLJS file. A uh, few requires a sample component, uh, definition of the app, and an init function uh, that can be used to, uh, to start up our application, which is basically just mounts the app, the root component, and the name of the div to go find and put it on. So that's going to be the the entire set of source that we need. Oh, wait, one more file. Um, the shadow C CLJS compiler config. And I'm actually going to edit that um, because I realized on the last recording of this video that I don't need that particular bit. Um, so here what I've done is I've said I'm using depths to find the dependencies and I want it to include the dev alias so it gets the CL, you know, the ClojureScript compiler and the, the stuff that's like compile time only. Um, I'm telling it to set up uh, a, a well-known port 9000 for me to be able to connect to the REPL so I can use a ClojureScript REPL easily for my development environment. 
uh, I'm telling it to start a development HTTP server on port 8000 serving out of resources public. So this will let me work with my uh, compiled code in the browser on port 8000 uh, while I'm running the compiler. And then you just need to list uh, uh, a sequence of builds. And this is just a map where the name of the build is the key and then the configuration is the value, which is yet a nested map. And here you want to target the browser instead of, say, node. Uh, we want to tell it the output directory for the JavaScript. And remember I said I was going to have a, a JS main relative to index, and index is in resources public. So I'm going to output to resources public JS main. And then I'm going to tell the uh, compiler as well that uh, from index's perspective, uh, slash JS slash main is where the any other compiled asset should go. So um, this is relative to the index file as well, basically. Then you have to configure uh, one or more modules for the build. And I'm just going to name this top level module main as well. It sounds a little repetitive. but um, And then a f the function to call to initialize the app. And Shadow CLJS can actually figure out from this what all sources needed. It finds that function, it looks at the requires, it pulls all those requires in, it looks at their requires, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, just like a spider uh, going out. And of course Shadow is able to use Google Closure for advanced builds to then dead code eliminate anything that's not actually used. Then during development uh, we're going to tell it anytime we load we want to recall in it and that will actually cause it to force refresh the UI for us. And then we're going to do some preloads. And the only preload that I'm going to do here is built into Fulcro, uh, and it's this namespace. And what this does is this injects the code that um, uh, tells Fulcro uh, your application it should connect to the Google, uh, not to the Google, to the yeah to the Google Chrome extension uh, that is the development tool for for dealing with Fulcro applications. So those are the configuration files we need set up, and that's pretty much all you need for a base closure script project. Now let's actually show you. How to, how to get going. Now, if you're an experienced Clojure, Clojure Script user and you use Space Max, great. If you use Vim, Vim Fireplace, great. Um, I personally prefer IntelliJ. Uh, I work in, in Teams and source formatting and incompatibility, et cetera, et cetera. It just, it's easy to teach anybody to use that tool. They don't have to uh, learn a bunch of new key sequences just to work. Uh, it has nice JVM integration. You can do you know debug source level uh, source level debug at the, on the closure side. Even if you're jumping into Java code, you can catch uncaught exceptions. You can do all sorts of interesting things. Uh, so I really do recommend that people use IntelliJ. It's got a community edition for if you're just doing you know your own personal non-commercial projects. Um, and you know the things that you'll want to configure here when you first get it up is you'll want to go to plugins, go to the marketplace, and search for cursive. And install that. You can see I've already got it installed here, and um, that'll that'll let you work with with Clojure code. And then uh, you just want to import a project. And if you've already got this open and you don't see this window, there might be a menu up here where you can choose file open dot dot dot. Um, either way, it should work. And then I'm just going to go to my home directory here into the demo project, and you're going to choose the depths uh, uh, Eden file. Open that use auto import. Uh, that's just a convenience option so if you edit the depths it'll automatically you know refresh itself when it sees the depths file change. Um, and then I think I may have yeah. Okay so you see this syncing. Now this tab over here may or may not be in exactly this place on your your version but the closure depths tab lets you go in here and, and enable or disable the various aliases that you have in the project and defined in your system. Some of these system ones I have defined in, in a global config file. So I want to make sure I could care less whether I get that get test one enabled, but I want to enable the dev one uh, and hit hit the refresh button here to tell it to go ahead and I'm done editing. Uh, and that will just make sure that, that all my source paths and things are, are on there and all of my um, uh, dependencies are listed here so I don't see a bunch of uh, yellow in some of my source code. Now if you haven't used IntelliJ um, before, just a couple of quick tips. Uh, one is this find action command. I've got it currently set to command shift. Command is you know, a little squiggly thing on, on Max A. Uh, this basically will let you execute any contextual action that makes sense uh, in the entire development environment. So you know command shift A uh, pull, like that would be a git pull. Um, or uh, you know, command.
commit files, that sort of thing. And you can see when you do that, the command line, you know, the, the keyboard shortcut will get that set to command K, which I think is the default for the OS X uh, keyboard shortcuts. Uh, so then I'll know, oh, if I hit command K, it'll come up and tell me, oh, all right, you've changed this file. What do you want to say about it? You know, etc. Okay. Now I have the terminal uh, extension installed in IntelliJ as well, so I can have a little shell terminal there, but I think I'll, I'll just use a regular command line here. So uh, if you have npm and node and npx all installed correctly, you should be able to type npx shadow cljs uh, start. And that should start up uh, everything that shadow cljs has been configured to start. So it'll start the, the compiler server, which will let you uh, have a web interface to start and stop builds. Uh, it'll also start your development um, uh, web server. Right, so we can see that's that's our HTML that we had before. And then 9630 is the default port that it throws uh, the build server on. And so we can just say start compiling. Let me shrink that one down to there and this one down to there. And the first build takes a little bit. The incremental builds uh, are, you know, get quite a bit faster than once the JVM is warmed up. Uh, a lot of times your incremental compiles will be just, you know, milliseconds. This first one usually takes 10 or 20 or something like that. Okay, so now you can see if I go over here, I didn't mean to have these in here already. Let's just like clean this up a little bit and. All right, so this is our, our base thing. So if we go over here and reload, we should see to do. Okay, so we've got it running. So I ran through that kind of quick. The, uh, the uh, compiler, uh, if you have multiple builds configured, you can turn them on and off here. Uh, this is a well-known location. It usually reports it to the, the console when you start it. And then this, again, is the dev um, HTTP server that I had configured. Uh, to, to run my builds. Now there's a nice, uh, uh, in IntelliJ, another nice thing, double shift lets you just search for everything. So like, for example, I could say client CLJS. Now notice uh, some of these files are coming from the shadow CLJS build directory. They're like cache files and such. And this happens in, in projects. So I usually use that command shift A, you know, do something, uh, you'll find one of the actions in the um, IDE. You can go through and mark directories that shouldn't be included. So for example, this compiled stuff in here I could mark as excluded. And now if I go looking for client.cljs, I won't get all that noise. Um, so that's a just kind of a useful tip. You know, if I'm looking for index HTML, uh, you can well imagine that, you know, if, if other like cache directories or whatever in there had copies of that, I'd just get like four and five hits and then I'd go to the wrong one. Okay, now, so let's get you connected to a REPL. So once the browser's running here, the next thing you need to know how to do is how to interact with this app. So the process is Shadow CLGS gives you this web interface, but it's really running in a Java VM via this terminal window. Um, and when you save your source code, it converts this to JavaScript and it ships it over to this running tab. Now, if I don't have this tab open, let me go up here. This is the, the next bit. Up here in the IDE, there's an add configuration and I can add a closure remote REPL and I can say localhost. And remember in that shadow CLGS file, I said I wanted a well-known REPL at 9,000. I can apply that, I can go to it, I can run it. I'm going to edit the name of it so that I keep track of which one it is because I might want one for closure as well. You can drag this to other places to you know, put the REPL in a more convenient location. Now technically this is, you're connected to the compiler itself which is running in the JVM. So I can run like Java things here. Um, but I don't want to run Java things here. And in fact the REPL is telling me it's a closure REPL. So uh, 
but this is Shadows REPL and it recognizes you can select some particular build. So let's go look at that shadow file again, right? So here's the REPL port I just mentioned that we just connected to. Um, here's a build name. So I'm saying give me the REPL for main. And it's going to tell me that's selected, but if I try to do anything in this REPL, it's going to tell me I'm not connected to a, a JavaScript environment, right? Because I closed my tab over here. So I open this tab up, now I can run that, and it actually runs. And just to prove it to yourself that it's it's there, uh, you could, for example, say JS console.log uh, hi, or JS alert hi, um, and you can see you're talking to that, that actual browser. Um, and just drive drive the point home a little little more that this this code this closure script code is ending up over here as JavaScript uh, namespaces get flattened into the JavaScript environment well not flattened so much as as just uh, you know app client init is a function that I can call um, over here uh, and so if I define something. And uh, the caret export means don't rename it when you minify the code. Um, but if I had some, you know, f of x over here, and I said make that x squared, I wait, hot code reload, uh, I should now be able to do an f of 3 and get 9. So, um, so that what's, that's what the compiler is doing. Now, very often you'll want to actually run code that you're playing with uh, from your editor. And that's a particularly handy thing to do uh, while using any Lisp. Um, and so I might want to, say, send some sub expression um, that I'm working on uh, to the REPL. So you see it, it, it I pressed a keyboard shortcut there and it, it appeared in the bottom. And what I'm actually doing here, if you look in the, um, it's command comma uh, on Mac to get to preferences into the key map. You can just search for send form. Um, and so there's send top form to the REPL and send form before caret to the REPL. And I have a lot of my closure key keyboard shortcuts set to control C followed by a different control sequence. So control C for closure and then F for top level form and E for you know expression before the, the caret and, and such. I just made them up so that they were mnemonically easier for me to remember. Um, so these two things are it's it's a good idea for you to set those to something uh, useful because you'll use them quite a bit so what I'm hitting here is the one that sends the, the expression before the, my caret so a, a, a form right is anything surrounded by parentheses it's it's any structured thing uh, I could send the number two I could send this addition or I could go to the end of the function and send the entire function to the REPL right that defined the function um, now, if I'm in the middle of some nested scope here, that's what the other one's for. Uh, if I send top form to REPL, that basically says walk up to here and then send the whole thing. Um, and then if you're in a comment block, uh, send top form means, uh, so let's say I'm in the middle here, you look down here, you see it sent the whole def A, and it ignored the fact that I was in a comment block. So those are all useful things uh, to know. You know how to select a build. You know how to send forms to a REPL, you know how to get that browser connection, uh, and you know how to get your, your project up and going. In the next video, we'll talk about actually doing some, some stuff with Fulcrum.